good afternoon, everyone. My name is Steve Murray. I'm director here at the Alabama Department of Archives and History, and it's my pleasure to welcome you here today. If you are a frequent uh, Food for Thought attendee, you'll know immediately that our format's a little bit different today. Uh, it's my pleasure to sit here in conversation with our guest, whom I'll introduce in just a minute, and we want to be sure the audience has plenty of time to get engaged. I see, I know some folks who are some Almond Brothers fans who are uh, here today, and we'll have some good time for discussion later. Let me start by making a few announcements. Let me remind you to please silence your electronic devices before we get started today. And also to share some announcements on some upcoming events. Our annual summer genealogy workshops are going to begin next month on Saturday, June 10th. You can check the archive, social media, and website later this week for registration information on those workshops. We look forward to seeing you at one or all of those. We also to remind you, in keeping with today's theme, that our Alabama Radio Moments exhibit will close at the end of May. So you want to be sure you come see that before that's gone. This afternoon after this program would be a great occasion to do that up on the second floor. Uh, any of our staff would be glad to help point you in the right direction. On Thursday, June 8th, we're going to have a special guest. Uh, National Park Service Superintendent Barbara Tagger will be here to discuss the importance of commemorating Black history and public history. She's been heavily involved in the commemoration development of the Selma to Montgomery Trail and is currently the superintendent at Horseshoe Bend National Military Park. That program will be live here in the Farley Auditorium and live streamed on our Facebook and YouTube channels. And lastly, I want to invite you to next month's installment of Food for Thought on Thursday, June 15th, when Megan Sullivan will be here to present Invisible History No More, Alabama's LGBTQ History. And we hope that you'll join us as part of that regularly scheduled program. Today, it's really my pleasure to welcome a speaker and a friend, uh, someone whom I've known for uh, going back to 2008. I think we just established yep. Bob. Bob Beatty is someone who is, uh, uh, there's really several important things to know about Bob, how much he loves his family, how much he loves public history, and how much he loves music. And if you <laughs> spend any time talking to him, those three things are going to come up in the conversation pretty quickly. Bob is a native Floridian. He started his career in public history as a curator of education at the Orange County Regional History Center. Spent several years there working on the ground and promoting better public awareness uh, of, of local history. Then he went to the American Association for State and Local History, which is headquartered in Nashville, and spent a decade there serving our entire professional community through professional development opportunities for history professionals promoting stronger organizations and networks throughout the United States, working in the field of public history. And then in 2016, started his own consulting company called the Lindhurst Group, where he shares the experience that he gained working in the field with uh, museums and historical societies all over the country, but really focused in the Southeast mostly. Uh, lots of folks who have benefited from his work as a consultant in recent years. Along the way, he went back to grad school, did a PhD in history at Middle Tennessee State University, where he wrote a dissertation that is the basis of the book that we're going to be talking about today, Play All Night, Dwayne Allman and the Journey to Fillmore East. So help me welcome my good friend, Bob Beatty. Thank you. That might be the nicest introduction I've ever had. And and is it is it misty in here just a little bit? Steve and I do go way back. And um, I just want to say very quickly before we get into this, um, this is one of the best run state history organizations in the country. And I know that. And yeah, give, give a hand because please, please. And I mean that. And that's not just because of Steve or not just because of Alex and the staff that are here, but definitely Steve's leadership and his staff's leadership in doing this. This is not an easy job. I have lived much of the, the issues that we all face as a history professional. And Steve has been a go-to guy for me a long time for understanding what's going on on the ground. It helps we're both Southerners. It helps we have a grounded our understanding and working with our fellow Southerners as we work through these discussions and, think, and, and about history and our past. Because we've, I think both of us have received some measure of um, you know, salvation is the wrong word to use, but there is, there's, 
truth and knowledge and there's power in knowledge. And um, Steve is a model of that. And this institution is a model of that open access to material. So I want to tell you guys, y'all have one of the best in the country. There's, there's more than 50, by the way, because states have multiple agencies who do this. But Steve has been a go-to for a long time. So appreciate the intro. Thank you. Thank you, Bob. There's a mutual admiration society here, folks. <laughs> All right. For that... Uh, before you leave today, you'll want to pick up a, I encourage you to pick up a copy of Bob's book. They're going to be for sale out in the lobby and he's going to be sticking around after the program and available to sign as, uh, we get into that. I'm going to hand that to you and two copies you need to buy, uh, <laughs> Bob, to get us started. I, I, my guess is we've got a lot of folks here who know the Almond brothers quite well, but in case there are some who are unfamiliar, let's, let's lay the groundwork here and place. Uh, them on the Southern and American music landscape. How do you describe the style of the Almond Brothers band and why are they significant? We'll start, we'll start with the first one. Um, the significance is this, and any of y'all who lived in this era. So let's, let's, let's talk about maybe you grew up in the, you know, um, mid sixties or, you know, in the sixties through that whole time period through the early 1970s. If you were a Southern musician in that era and you had a band you had to leave the South in order to make it as a musician. And that happened to the Almond Brothers. Um, let's, so, so the most significant thing I think for them is the fact that they were the first band of the rock era to stay in the South, to live and record in the South, and basically launch nationally from the South. If you study your Alabama history, you know what's going on in the South at this time period. Um, uh, uh, it is a fraught, complicated time in the American South as the South deals with the civil rights movement and the echoes of what that means. And the South has a terrible reputation nationally. And there is a general consensus in, and true of their record company. Nothing's ever going to come out of the South. So the first thing I think is that is that they were a band of, um, of Southern musicians who lived, worked and um, toured from the American South. And that open the door for generations of Southern musicians after them. They're founders of, they're, they're progenitors of the term Southern rock that we know of through Leonard Skinner and Marshall Tucker Band and other bands throughout this area. Um, and then yet they're also very much representative of that sound two or three years into their career. Um, who they are, let's back up on that. I did mention they're Southerners and they're all in the picture here. I just need to reevaluate. The dude laughing is Greg Allman. That's the younger brother. I'm sorry, the dude standing up, la they're all laughing. The gorgeous guy, because Greg is just a really good looking dude, uh, standing up laughing um, is uh, Greg Allman with the blonde hair, sitting down to his right in between um, uh, the African-American, that's J-Mo and is Dwayne. Dwayne's standing there smiling because he's got a bag of dope in his hands. Um, that's why everybody's laughing, actually. He had just scored. Um, Greg and Dwayne are from Daytona Beach, Florida, uh, by way of um, Nashville. They were born in Nashville. Their family, um, mother's, his, his father's family is mostly from that area. Their dad was killed in a robbery. He was a D-Day veteran. And Dwayne was two, Greg was short, was just about one, or may have been three and two. Either way, their mother never remarried, more or less raised them in Daytona Beach. By the way, Southern story, all small town South. You know, I was going through your gallery and you talked a lot about small town Alabama. This is all small town South. This isn't rural South. This isn't country blues or, or you know, music that's coming from rural areas. These are Southerners in small towns and cities who are meeting each other and playing music. A lot of them around federal military bases or the space industry that's here, um, you know, the TVA up in Muscle Shoals, et cetera. Uh, okay. Uh, J-Mo, who's a, directly above me, African-American drummer from uh, Gulfport, Mississippi, um, and has tour, had toured around prior to joining the Allman Brothers with Percy Sledge, uh, mainly uh, uh, a couple others. He was oh, and behind Otis Redding. Sorry, that was the big one that he toured behind. Uh, Dickie Betts sitting down with his legs kind of spread there. Dickie is from West Palm Beach, Florida, and also uh, Sarasota, Southwest Florida. And incidentally, it's like West Palm Beach is like 20 miles down south of where I'm originally from. So that, you know, like I feel this weird connection to that story. But Dickie is, uh, uh, grows up 
Um, he, he, he's probably the most rural of all of them, grows up playing country music with his family and eventually joins forces with Barry Oakley, who is um, right next to Greg standing the final one there. Barry's actually from Chicago, uh, has only been in the South since about 1967 when he joins the Allman Brothers Band in 71. But I call him a Southerner because he identifies as a Southerner. So there we are back with identification. Um, because really, seriously, even the little bit of talking you can hear Barry Oakley doing he's already affected a little bit of a southern draw and he just feels comfortable here that's it the final one to describe here butch trucks is another drummer i should i didn't say that two guys on the end are drummers Dwayne and dicky are lead guitarists barry oakley plays bass greg plays organ uh, and sings and writes um all of them had been in bands uh and tried to make it Dwayne and greg had twice went gone for the brass ring once as a band called the almond joys just a fantastic name I, I i think it's just great um they went to nash they actually um uh auditioned in new york city and nashville southerners had to go to new york they had to go to nashville they had to go to la that's how you made it um and then uh they went first as the Almond Joys, then they also went out to LA as a band called the Hourglass. And that was the final band really that Dwayne and Greg were in before they formed the Almond Brothers Band. Hourglass, I'll bring it really quickly back to Muscle Shoals, recorded a demo at Muscle Shoals in April of 1968. Jimmy Johnson, who was the engineer of that session was absolutely elated with their sound. Um, as was the band, they went out to LA, their record company didn't like it and they broke up. And Dwayne ends up basically moving back to Muscle Shoals and that's where he really starts his entire career. That's where this story really starts to take off. Good, good. Is that a good summation? Absolutely. Uh, so the, the book itself is not a biography of Dwayne. It's not a biography of the band. It's really the biography of an album, right? It's Correct. It kind of gives you the history and the context that leads to this live recording at Fillmore East. And why, why is that album so significant? Yeah, it's, you know, I call it a biography of a sound because I did get pretty deep into what made the music that comes out on Fillmore East. Uh, it, you don't just start with Statesboro Blues that we played, which is, you know, it's a really great track recorded, you know, um, live with all the marbles and, and, all, and all the everything at stake. Um, it takes time for Dwayne and his bandmates to develop a sound. I'll fast forward to when the band gets together in March of 1969, Dwayne leaves Muscle Shoals. He leaves a really cushy gig. The quote is, they kept telling me I could sit around and make five bills a week and just sit on my ass and play. And Dwayne said, I am not a sitting on my ass kind of guy. So he was in Muscle Shoals for about five months. And the first thing he wanted to do was put a touring band together when he got a record contract after recording Hey Jude, which I think is coming in a bit. Um, the band puts out their first record after being um, around for, well, they record the first record about less than five months after they're together, August of 1989, they're uh, 69. Their debut record comes out. Um, they expect it to be a blockbuster. Phil Walden, the record label owner in um, Capricorn in Macon, um, had like a thermometer on his door for, you know, like 10,000 units, 20, 30, up to like 500,000. They didn't even fill the bottom thing of like 30,000 units with their first record. Then they record their second record in 1970 with Tom Dowd. This is the same time Dwayne starts recording Layla with Eric Clapton. That's how they meet, actually. They're, they're, um, uh, Clapton's recording Layla. The Allman Brothers are at a concert in Miami, and they see each other and meet. Idlewild South comes out in September of 1970, and also barely dense the charts and those of you who are fans and live that era if you bought those first two albums um you were one a rare individual because not a lot of people bought those records <clears throat> number two you would probably say what every reviewer who had seen them live said this is really good but if you've seen them live it doesn't compare there's no comparison to seeing them live and now I'm going to tell you, that's, you know, certainly my experience. Well, it wasn't my experience, actually, because I was receiving all of this as, as you know, on the back end. The band decided to record their third album live. So I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to get into some really weird detail for y'all. Hopefully you'll follow this. This isn't just a live album. 
Okay. This isn't muddy waters at Newport where every song, every stage announcement, uh, it just, they just record the whole thing and they put out the entire 40 minutes, 30 minutes of the show. This is a carefully curated document from four different concerts that they recorded. Actually, they played six concerts and recorded four. And so they picked the best of those of those um, selections to put on this record. Why is a live record important and why is it, why is it, um, why, why, I'm sorry, why is it weird to do a live record for a band that hasn't sold but 150,000 units in two records? Live albums were filler for record companies. Live albums helped record companies sell product between studio records or between singles. This is still a medium where singles are hits. Singles are the goal. At Fillmore East, all but two of the songs, top eight minutes, the single is like three something minutes. So they're not recording for singles. They're also though, not just going up there haphazardly, hitting record and playing a concert. They played a very carefully crafted set list that they had been rehearsing all year. You, there's all their live shows up to that are basically the same shows. They're honing their arrangements as they go. And then the light goes on and they do everything in one take. That's essentially what it is. Why is that significant? Well, Kind of Blue, do you, anybody know the record Kind of Blue, Miles Davis, Kind of Blue, best-selling jazz album in history, one of the greatest records ever. Kind of Blue is also recorded exactly like that, except it's in a studio. So the answer to not selling was, and I'm, I'm burying the lead a little bit because they were going to break up the band. This was their last chance. The answer was, we're going to go record a live album. Everything on that record is 100% live. There are no edits. There are no overdubs. That is not true of hardly any other live album in history, but certainly of that era. The songs were mixed as if they were individual songs, instead of the crowd noise being mixed going into the next song, it fades out. I hate it, by the way. I'd much rather it flow. It sounds better. But they were like, we want you to hear this song as a song. And the deal was they knew if they were going to break through, they were going to break through doing it their own way and playing live was it. The audience, you guys, if you were there in that era or if you attended any Allman Brothers show in their 45-year career, we were very important to that equation. They weren't playing to us. They were playing for us, somewhat with us. And how we reacted is important to them. And that's, you can hear a difference in the music. Um, of the songs, two of them Fillmore East were released on studio records. Just listen to Liz Reed on Idle Wild South versus the version on Fillmore East. Just listen to Whipping Post on the first album. The, the energy, the emotion, the passion, you can hear it in my voice, actually, because I'm rising up. Absolutely. So this interaction with the live audience is, is, is a critical component. But you also talk about the importance of improvisation in the book and, and go back to that connection with jazz and Miles Davis's influence and how, how the band played together. Yeah. So one of the things about Southern music in general and this was true about the studios up in Muscle Shoals. It was true about the studios in, in Memphis as well. Um, is things were a little bit looser in the studio as you worked on arrangements. And solos were often composed in the moment. Dwayne's solos on much of his Muscle Shoals stuff, in fact, I'm guessing all of it, where it's just done in the moment. Dwayne, but in particular Dickie and Barry when it first started, and J-Mo, we're huge on the improvisational aspect of music. Music comp composition in the moment is how Warren Haynes, who joined the Allman Brothers Band later, says. Um, for them, the situation, it, I'm sorry, let me back up. Let me back up for jazz for just a second. Jazz was new to the Allman Brothers. Uh, uh, jazz is a Southern musical tradition. Uh, jazz. The best way to explain it, and I, I'm sorry I, I faded a bit as I was talking about this. The best way I can explain jazz is the song My Favorite Things. Um, think about the song on uh, Sound, of, Sound of Music. Raindrops and roses, right? John Coltrane turned that into a 14-minute jam called My Favorite Things, incidentally. And that song, along with All Blues from Miles' Kind of Blue, were the two songs I think that really got Dwayne in a manner of, oh, wait a second. Um, my favorite things, 
he he understands and and jazz musicians do is a song with a melody and it's got some changes in it but what jazz musicians do is they take the melody and they go off and they you know do their thing i i, I was gonna do a beep, 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 boop, boop. you know how jazz musicians are terrible rendition of scatting um but if you can think about the difference between my favorite things from Julie Andrews singing versus versus John Coltrane, if you've heard it, it's a piano driven track with his saxophone um, speaking in the moment. Dwayne and his bandmates really did thrive in that environment. Um, they were all self-trained for the most part. I think Butch has the most or had the most um, formal training, but they were all self-trained. And I think they, I mean, generally it's their term was hitting the note. And in the idea being when we are creatively improvising, we're creating something greater than us. And the audience is a part of that as well. So they can improvise all they want in the studio, but the audience's energy and that building Fillmore East was a special building, which I didn't get to quite yet, but everybody's kind of on top of you. Um, and so it's, it's like the, the perfect moment and they captured it on tape they captured the feeling of adventure and improvisation. Those guys are, they are literally walking on a high wire. Sometimes alone, you will listen to just one guitarist in a decrescendo part, Dwayne, a couple different times and you don't love me. Um, they are walking a high wire and the soloist is taking the Allman Brothers know, here's the beginning, here's the middle, here's the end. How you get to those different places is all improvised. It's all about musicians feeling how the other guys in the band are pushing him or her what responses are we get is, is he getting from the audience or or you know from just his own you know uh, uh playing and that's the thing about this record the whole sessions are out they've been released every song is completely different every single song the solos they will go in similar places but they're still not playing the same thing i've listened to this band for 45 years yeah they repeat some licks and stuff from time to time but they're it's never the same and, and so the path to being able to be a commercial success with that kind of style is not an easy one. So let's, let's back up and talk about Dwayne's path to how they get to being able to do that eventually. So 1968, he's struggling to make the transition from a really skilled cover band leader to, to, to make it into a commercial success. So he goes out to L.A., What's his experience out there? So he goes to LA with two Alabamians, actually, Paul Hornsby and Johnny Sandlin. He and Greg and a um, bass player uh, who's, is that Mabur McKinney? Was he an hourglass the first round? They go out and they, they get a record contract. They were a top flight live band all throughout the South. They had joined forces with Johnny uh, Sandlin and um, Paul Hornsby, who were in the five minutes with Eddie Hinton because Hinton quit to go to Muscle Shoals and become the, the basically the staff guitarist there. So they go out to LA and they are under the auspices of Liberty Records and a producer named Dallas Smith. What's really interesting about Liberty is they had Canned Heat, which was a boogie blues band. They had, they distributed Johnny Winter's first record. Johnny Winter, and Dwayne Allman was compared to Johnny Winter almost repeatedly throughout his life. And I've got a lot of Johnny in the book because Dwayne also saw Winter as somebody he did. But the record company instead, it was like, it's like pop psychedelia. It sounds like Blood, Sweat and Tears or Tom Jones on top of maybe some Southern bluesy kind of sound. Um, they're dressed up in psychedelic clothes. They look kind of ridiculous and they release one record as Hourglass, it fails. They release another one, it fails. It's very clear that Dallas Smith and Liberty thought Greg Allman was the star. And at this time, the guy out front who's singing, who happens to be good looking, and I, I'm not saying that like for any other reason, but like the dude is a, is, 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 is a face, Greg is. Dwayne, not as much. And Dwayne got relegated to the back and he didn't like it. And he eventually just quit. And he quit sometime in August of 68 and is still under contract in L.A. Greg actually has to stay and finish the contract. Dwayne moves back south, uh, goes to Jacksonville, forms in, in three weeks. Greg comes back for like a vacation. Greg's always going back. In three weeks, Dwayne gets with Butch Trucks and his band, the 31st of February, and Greg, and they record some demos that are out there, 31st of February demos. Um, they tour a little bit. Then Greg splits for LA, doesn't tell anybody, 
And Dwayne shows up in Muscle Shoals um, and weasels his way on a Clarence Carter session. Um, that leads to Dwayne getting the call for the Wilson Pickett session the next month in October. And that was when Dwayne earned his contract. Leo, let's talk about this a little bit more. So this is this is brings us back to Muscle Shoals and Dwayne's the way you describe it in the book, it is the persistence of his personality and the argument that he makes to Wilson Pickett about doing a cover, right? Yes. And so why is that such a uh, daunting idea to Wilson Pickett and, and, and how does Dwayne convince y'all know Wilson Pickett, the wicked Pickett. He's from Alabama, right? Yeah. So he comes down from Detroit, I think, cause he had relocated, um, you know, to record at Muscle Shoals and, um, it's a big deal. Atlantic is about to release this record. They were getting some killers to play and they're playing and nothing much is going. And all of the white dudes go out to dinner in Muscle Shoals. Jimmy Johnson says effectively, listen, the hippies got as much crap as the black dudes do. We couldn't go out with Dwayne, a hippie and a black dude to a local restaurant. So they stay back and Dwayne convinces Wilson Pickett to cover the Beatles. Hey Jude, this is um, October of 1968. I think the song had just been released by the Beatles. Um, Wilson Pickett didn't want to do it for any number of reasons. Um, but I don't think he was really all that familiar with the song maybe, but because whatever ends up happening, it's pretty magical. But yes, Dwayne, through his persistence, he's on this session. He's 22 years old. Actually, he's not even 22 yet. Um, yes, he is. Uh, almost 22 years old. And he stares down Wilson. They called him Wicked Pickett. He was not a, apparently an easy guy to get a, a, or around or get along with. Not only stares him down, convinces him to record this Beatles song, and it becomes a massive hit. You know, it like, hits the 20s. Was anybody alive and or, or remember when Hey Jude by Wilson Pickett was on the radio. It would have been it would have been late 68, early 69, I think, is when it finally broke. Around the same time Dwayne records or the Rethas, um, the weight also. But yeah, it was a big deal. And here's this young punk. And Rick Hall says it uh, in several different accounts, you know, like he brought the future. He was, we were a real button down. The, the musicians will say Weegins and khakis set. And here comes this wild man with long hair and bowling shoes and striped trousers, you know, smoking weed and, and convincing Wilson Pickett to record the Beatles. It was a, it was a, you know, it was a groundbreaking, you know, uh, uh, opportunity. He had just failed in LA, like literally just been sent out. Forget it. Yeah. So, so this is worth a listen. So we're gonna we're gonna get a clip of Hey Jude. Tell us what to listen for from from Dwayne here and, and from Pickett. So this is the code of the song that the Beatles part that goes na 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 na. You know the singing part. Um, incidentally, George Harrison actually posed or posited he wanted a guitar solo and and uh, 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 McCartney shot him down. I just read that recently. So Dwayne and um, uh, Wilson Pickett are improvising here. They might have run through the arrangement a couple times. This solo fades out. Dwayne is answering. Listen to, this is, this is straight from the church. This is straight from blues. This is straight from jazz. Listen to Dwayne and Wilson Pickett as they push each other. Apparently they were face to face. Dwayne had, I have chills. Dwayne had his amp wide open and a Fender twin, if you're a guitar player, is the loudest amp in the world to be standing next to you wide open. Um, and so here we go. All right, Zach. <laughs>
don't really have a good chance to try. Take that out. They, so I just want to, I want to listen. The arrangement is completely different. So cover songs. This was an issue Dwayne had prior to joining the Almond Brothers band. Was his cover songs were very, very, very similar to the songs that he that he matched on. If you listen to the Almond Joys, they recorded uh, a song called Spoonful, which was a Willie Dixon song, but made famous by um, Helen Wolf. It's an exact copy of a Paul Butterfield version. They played Crossroads, which is an exact copy, not of the Cream version, but of a version Eric Clapton did pre-Cream. Um, and then you get this. And Rick Hall said Dwayne arranged that, this track. So the whole arrangement itself, how you play the chords, how you get to that coda, um, that was all done in the studio in real time. So another improvisational idea. And so this gets Hall's attention in a different way because he'd been thinking about Dwayne as just this hippie who's hanging around, sleeping in a tent in the parking lot, right? In, in the weeks leading up Yeah, to I this. don't believe that story, by okay. the way. But yes, apocryphal. Apocryphal. I think it's apocryphal, yes. Uh, but Dwayne gotta... had, Dwayne was a rock star, man. He had women, and I'm not saying, like he, I doubt he ever stayed in his car or in a tent or anything else. The guy would, had girlfriends from the time he was like 14. How, how in the world are you up here in Muscle Shoals? You have friends here too. I'm sorry, I don't believe it. And rest in peace, Rick Hall. I, I just don't believe that story. Go ahead. Well, I said it in Alabama, I'm gonna get struck dead. Well, this is a good chance. Give, give, <laughs> give us a couple of paragraphs uh, from the book on, on this relationship. So Dwayne gets a contract, Rick Hall signs him. He's like, holy crap, this guy is good. Here's the deal though everybody's hearing it. Uh, Jerry Wexler at Atlantic, who's on, 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 who's distributing Hey Jude, he hears it. Who is this guy? It's not your normal guy. Phil Walden over in Macon, Georgia is like, who is this guy? He's not your normal guitarist. So it's heard. So um, this, this is actually really great. Thank you. Recording for Hall at Fame differed from Smith in LA. This is pre- um, solo stuff. The producer and record label still dictated song choice, but fame sessions were less grueling, a combination of the South's more laid back atmosphere and the wishes of the artists who recorded there. We did mostly R&B stuff and those cats were real loose, Dwayne said. Hall just wanted everybody on the session to play their ass off, never told you what to play. Long stifled creatively, he valued the atmosphere of quote, play whatever the hell you felt produced organic music. Dwayne worked as a regular session musician for less than seven months, arrived in Muscle Shoals September 1968, relocated in January 1969, and relocated in late February, early March. During the relatively brief interlude, Dwayne, record Dwayne recorded with luminaries Aretha Franklin, Arthur Conley, Clarence Carter, King Curtis, Laura Lee, and Spencer, Spencer Wiggins. And Muscle Shoals, he also built his reputation on slide guitar, which represented the majority of his session work in this era. Dwayne Slide first appeared on Clarence Carter's The Road of Love. It was added, actually, to a previously released track. His slide set a swampy groove on Aretha Franklin's cover of the band's The Weight, and his blistering solo anchored a track that reached number 24 in March 1969. But whether playing slide or traditional fretted guitar, Dwayne earned respect in Muscle Shoals. Hall remarked that Dwayne could eat up a guitar like nobody I had ever heard in my life. He had absolute faith in his abilities. He believed he was the most unique and gifted guitar player in the world. Allman's infectious personality and intense focus on music left Hall smitten. He always had a positive attitude and a smile from ear to ear. I never heard him say a bad word about anybody. Not ever. He was so wrapped up in his music that he didn't have time for jealousy or gossip. He was always totally focused on his music and totally wrapped up in the moment. Hall concluded, Dwayne bought tomorrow into my studio and into my life. Dog and I weren't writing the same book, but I was totally into his free spirit, never say die attitude and the mind boggling things he could do with his guitar. Dwayne's music and his way of thinking were much more influential on me than I ever was on him. Terrific. So, so the, the, the freedom that he finds in Muscle Shoals to really showcase what he can do with these singers gets the attention of Phil Walden. And so we get this transition. The next chapter takes the Allman Brothers Band to Macon, Georgia. 
well, the, the band gets put together, right? Yes. Spends time putting together the band. Phil takes them to Macon. What happens in Macon in those subsequent months? So the band fi- is founded in Jacksonville, Florida. Chapter 7 is really where that pivots um, all together. You sort of spell out all the different elements. Boom, the band is together. So the last half of the book is really Dwayne's journey, true, like the rest of the journey to Fillmore East. They're forming a house in Jacksonville. They actually get in trouble with the law. Um, uh, gun charge and a reefer charge, actually. And they basically basically are told by their attorney, get the hell out of Dodge and no one's going to worry about you. So they moved to Macon, Georgia, where Phil Walden is. Phil Walden has been running a booking company and eventually manages um, Otis Redding and several others, including personally says Arthur Conley, these musicians who Dwayne played with out uh, in Muscle Shoals. Walden, um, Rick Hall tries to make a record with Dwayne and it doesn't go well. They don't get along very well. Rick Hall has a certain way of doing things it's the opposite of Dwayne's, as that as that piece said. So Rick sells his contract to a partnership of Jerry Wexler of Atlantic Records and Phil Walden at that point um, about to found uh, Capricorn Records. So Capricorn becomes the head of or the, the hub for the Allman Brothers. They moved there in um, April 1969. Eventually, in January, they... Um, move into this big house, a communal house. I see somebody, there's my man with the big house shirt on, um, the big house, which is now an Allman Brothers Museum. And they live there. That is home base for the Allman Brothers, really through the first breakup in the mid 1970s. Um, They kind of splinter and move out of the town from there, but it's always been kind of spiritual home. Uh, They record the first record in New York, the second record in Miami at Criteria, and the third record at Fillmore East. Um, fourth record in Criteria Miami. And it's not until Brothers and Sisters that they start recording at Capricorn Studios. And at that point, that's when Charlie Daniels band comes down, Marshall Tucker band comes through Macon and Macon becomes like the hub of this new movement called Southern Rock. But Macon is where they launched from. Macon was home. It was vitally important. I mentioned before about the South. They did not want to go elsewhere to live and to, and to, create music. They wanted to create music at home, play it on the road, come back home. And that's what they did. Um, and you know, make it making is one of the oddest places in the world, except for maybe Muscle Shoals, frankly, to be like a, a, a major hub of anything, right? I mean, Muscle Shoals is way out there in the middle of nowhere, but the confluence of events where it sits and what's going on around them, you know, there's more talent that comes out of that just and heads up to Nashville before that recording industry even takes off. So there's something obviously going on in the South. How do you make it? And they figured it out. Excellent. You've, you've touched on this a little bit already. Uh, the, the, the reason Dwayne stays back in the studio uh, that day and doesn't go to lunch <laughs> is because of the, the South, um, the, the, the difficulty of being in public in an integrated band with someone who has this kind of counterculture uh, presence and in, in appearance. Talk a little bit more about how the band was able to uh, push against that and, and, and talk a little bit about how music can help to break down those barriers, but also the, the limitations of music when in, in the face of some of those barriers. You know, yeah. I- it didn't surprise me when I did the research, you know, you get a quote from Johnny Sandlin about being around Mobile or Pensacola and saying, you know, to have long hair in a Navy town or in a military town in the sixties was, was really out there. And Dwayne and Greg were the first and like Hornsby says it. And uh, Gary Rossington of the, of, of uh, Leonard Skinner says it like they were the first guys to like do this full time, wear their hair long and look the part in the South. And so they inspired all these other people, but no, it wasn't easy. And I'll tell you, I, you know, when you study Southern history, one of the first things I think you have to confront when you study modern Southern history is the civil rights movement and, or the, you know, the issues the South has always had with, with race, which by the way, is not a Southern problem. It's a national issue. We just have a certain way we do. We have done it down here. And so when you you always have to look at that, it becomes a part of what you do an integrated band outside of like California is almost unheard of, if not unheard of in this era. They're driving around with a black dude. They're hippies. They've got a lot of women around them. It's not 
a safe situation many times. In fact, it's a very dangerous situation. Dwayne and Greg, it really started in Daytona Beach. I am pretty convinced they were, um, it, it's very obvious they did not like segregation. They did not like the impact it had on their black friends, on the musicians that they played with, um, on life. It's, it's you know, they, they fought against that in their own way. Um, they were not civil rights crusaders, but I'm going to tell you, they were absolutely civil rights crusaders because going back to what you said, uh, when you're a Southerner, uh, you grew up in the South, you're, you know, you're supposed to be a football player or something else. Us nerds, intellectually people, or us who, some of us will play guitar. And that's the way that we sort of gravitate toward the team aspect of, I'm not a great athlete, but I can do this. Um, music is a, and can be an equalizing force. When you're on the bandstand or when you're playing, it, it really doesn't matter who you are. If you got the chops, you can play. Now that leads us to think that that meant that there was no issues in Southern studios or on bandstands or anything else. And that's not true. I mean, it, it just is a fact of life, but music is equalizing. And I do think, and Walden has said this, and I think there will be some others that will come to say this. I think the Allman brothers, because they were integrated did help show that the South was different than what Neil Young was singing about in the songs about <laughs> this state. You know, I do think that, um, and, I think the fact that they were integrated um, said, and the fact that they were integrated and, and, and were very defiant about that says a whole hell of a lot about them um, as human beings. Uh, and, and, you know, it was, it was bad enough to be traveling around as hippies, but it was really bad to be traveling around with hippies with a black guy. And they did it. Say a little bit about the, the experience of researching and writing this book, Bob. And, and one thing in particular, you also blog about public history. And I was reading one of your recent blog posts and talking about the uh, amount of material that continues to become available online as archives digitize their collections. Say a little bit about some of these materials that you're finding, yeah. college newspapers, that kind of thing. This is, this is really where Steve and I are like super tight because he got his start over there at Auburn and, um, you know, doing public humanity stuff. Um, so there's all, everybody's like, did you interview so-and-so? Did you talk to him? And I started to, and they don't, Honestly, because I'm a stranger, they're not telling me anything they haven't already said. So it's just easy enough for me to go through and just find, you know, these general sources of, of what Jimmy Johnson has said or Paul Hornsby has said or, or something like that. Um, where the big gap was in all the other books on the Allman Brothers is the audience voice. There's really nothing said about Beyond the standard, uh, uh, there's a couple articles that will be in Rolling Stone magazine, Cream, I think, covered them once. But for the most part, these reviews of the kind of shows that the Allman Brothers were playing in 69, 70, and 71 are in college newspapers. They're not even in the alternative newspapers, you know, like the the the, the weekly. It's more the college newspapers. And so, um, I don't know, it's probably 20 years ago, the National Endowment for the Humanities, uh, an organization that right now um, – is is, uh, is about 150 million dollars um at thereabouts i think about 50 each of us give about 50 cents to this organization one of the finest agencies in the federal government if you ask me because of how careful they are with their money and how they do things and it's they gave money to entities to digitize these college newspapers and the best part about it for me is the name Almond is not very common. I said this last night too. So I can look up in a, a, a database of the newspaper and I can put in Almond from 1969 to about 76. And I basically only get Almond Brothers stuff. The other day I did it at the University of Miami and I didn't put time parameters in and I got 182 hits. About 50 of them actually were good. So the availability of this material has been vital. I can't make it to the Alabama Department of Archives and History and sit through and look at everything you might possibly have on this. So it made it so easy for me. And over the course of this 20 years I've been doing this, you know, public history stuff, my normal career, I've been compiling information, not even realizing what I was doing until it came down to sit down and write it.
and put it together. And the dissertation was 144,000 words. This is 85. And so I had to leave a lot out. Um, and I had to really hone in on like what my quotes were going to be and how those messages, I, I bet I've gone through every, in fact, I, whenever, whenever I catch a tiny error in a sentence, I know it's because I went through it too many times and I ended up slicing like one last word that I shouldn't have or something. And, but, but the material really does come from there. And, and the fan voice was vital to me. It was because, and the name play all night. I don't know if y'all know 1618 in, um, you don't love me play all night. You'll hear it. It's a fan who yells that out, right? So um, I had to fill that gap, Steve, and, and it can't be somebody telling me in 2010 you know, what it was like to see the Allman Brothers in 71. I had to learn that, right? I don't. They might have said the same thing that they said in 71, but there's a lot of water under the bridge in those times. Memory messes with things. So I went to the I, – I discovered why primary sources are so vital, because there's none of that there. It's all their subjectivity when they write it down. That's it, you know? Good. Great example of the importance of preservation and, and digitization. Well, let's let's uh, turn and see what questions our, our audience has. We've got lots of folks here in the auditorium. We've got uh, watchers online. If you'd like to ask Bob a question, raise your hand. Alex is going to get you a microphone. Please wait for the mic so we can be sure our online audience can hear the question. Hi, um, I'm really curious about the time Dwayne Allman worked at Muscle Shoals Sound Studio after leaving Fame, where I guess he recorded with six or seven different artists at Muscle Shoals Sound Studio. And I'm kind of curious if you know why he didn't continue at Fame and why he moved was I heard something that he had tried to record an album of his material uh, with Rick Call, who said, yeah, go ahead and do it, but apparently was charging him for it all. So he actually owed Rick Call a lot of money. But I don't know if okay, that's um, true. So, so what, you know, the question is there's two main studios in, in, in Muscle Shoals, Fame, which is Rick Hall's, and then sometime in, I guess, um, early 69, the, uh, the, the Swampers opened Shoals Sound. That's this book, by the way. I mean, shirt I bought the first time I met Steve. I just, that's why I'm wearing this particular yeah. grungy old shirt, honoring that. Um, Okay, here's here's what I know happened. Dwayne and Dwayne was recording a solo album with Rick Hall. It wasn't going well. That they were not simpat simpatico. Dwayne was frustrated. Rick Hall was frustrated. Um, if you read, Christopher Reale just wrote a book on Muscle Shoals, and he has a really good section on Rick Hall's personality that really made me understand why that relationship didn't work. By the time they opened Shoals Sound, Dwayne was pretty much done with session work. And they called him up uh, to play on the Boss Skag session, and he agreed to do it. But he was pretty done with sh with the Shoals altogether. Why he never went back to Fame, um, you know, my understanding is Rick Hall was was made whole by Wexler and and um, and Walden, but maybe Dwayne owed him some money. But it could be Rick Hall had Eddie Hinton and didn't really want to want another guitarist either and Dwayne wasn't in the business of it once Mar March 69 he was pretty much I'm doing this full-time from here on out and played some sessions down at Criteria but never I don't think he came back here after the boss gag session uh I think he recorded with John Hammond Ronnie Hawkins Lulu Cal Hammond Hammond was in Muscle Shoals that was probably a show sound that might have been at fame uh Lulu uh, Ronnie Hawkins is definitely Miami um, at Criteria. Do you have it up here? Uh, actually, I will say uh, David Hood. You look like uh, David. Are you related to David Hood? No. I, I swear I to God, I when were, I saw you, I go, holy crap, David Hood came to my talk. Wonderful person. But he loaned me his journals. And the good thing is he he calls them journals. They're actually more appointment calendars this needs to be in that the archive. have session names written on it uh but he doesn't always say 
what was recorded in Miami and what was recorded here. Now, I know like the Lulu and the Ronnie Hawkins were all recorded at Muscle Shoals Sound Studio because it actually says in the journal the dates and the okay. times. I'm just not sure why, why he was there uh, during this time where the Allman Brothers had really already formed. Yeah, and it, it, it could have just, but he still played studio work. So I, you know what, I'm live on YouTube and I'm gonna say, I gotta look at this and figure out this timeline because I had understood it sort of ended with, with the, the um, ended with the Boss Gag session. But either way, I think the issue with Rick Hall probably had less to do with anything other than the fact Dwayne wasn't doing studios and Rick had his own stuff, I think. But we should talk more. And that okay. journal should be in your archives. Thank hint, hint copies of that. Thank you. Hello. I just wanted to bring up a point. Um, when the Allman Brothers came out, you just mentioned the drummers. I had never seen a group that had two drummers and each one seemed to play in harmony with the other. They fed off of each other. And as they say, when they hit the note, it was more uh, imp improvised playing, like you said. Those guys, for sure, two drummers being able to play and stay out of each other's way is phenomenally difficult and talks about how connected those guys are as musicians and as uh, to each other as well as to music in general. Yeah, and at that time, it was new to all of us to see a black drummer and a white drummer. And the fact that they could go together as one, and they seemed to be feeding into Dwayne and Greg and all of them. And like you said, they'd improvise, and that's when they were really he needed the bridges up. Yeah, he needed that big bass of sound, you know, th this, th 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 their music changes over 45 years and it, it but it, but it's on this foundation of two drums and a monster bass player. And I'd go on record, say Barry Oakley hadn't been killed a year after Dwayne in a similar, well, it's exact same way in a motorcycle accident. Um, right. As they were also on top of the world, he would be in the Pantheon as one of the greatest rock bassists in history. Um, what he does on Fillmore East is, is incredible. And I'll tell you, it's only the tip of the iceberg of to what that guy plays live when, with whatever you can hear from it. It was a, they, he needed two drummers. We didn't really get into the lineup, but, but there's two lead guitarists too. And that's also weird. Dwayne was like, lead guitarists are like gunslingers, man. They are, we, we, I don't do it, but I know a lot to do who love to show you how good, the, good they are. And I, I learned a long time ago, if you're trying to show somebody how good you are, you're not, you don't belong with that group of people. So I don't try to do it, but that's how they carry themselves. And this guy, Dwayne had a lot of charisma and a lot of confidence. And he brought in a guitarist, Dickie Betts, who was every bit his equal as a player and a much better composer, probably one of the finest composers in that band um, there. So the two drums always gets them. And, and, um, even bands that have two drummers really don't deploy them the same way. A lot of times it's a drum and a percussion. And they added a percussionist in 1991 and Mark Quinone is one of the, like a top Latin percussionist who stayed with them for the latter part of their career. It's pretty incredible. A lot of people I know really, 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 really like the drums in the Allman Brothers band. Yeah. A lot of people I know. Other questions? They're dumbfounded, just like after an Allman Brothers concert. They're so wowed, they don't know how to speak. Oh, we have another one. Yes, sir. I'm not trying to hog the microphone, but the point you just made also is each musician was above the normal musicians you saw, but they all gave each one room, you know, like Dickie Betts and Dwayne. They could play back and forth, and... They made room for one another, and that's what made them so great, I think. Yeah, the, the listening part, the team part, the improvisation, the group creativity, the, the whole is greater than the sum of its parts, which is, you know, it's e pluribus unum also, to be honest with you, right? It's out of many, we are one, and they put this music that does define a generation for folks. Um, and this album is the one that did it. And, and, you know, the sad part is we haven't really gotten to, but four days out. So that the, the, this record sells 
half a million copies between July and October of 1971. Um, they had not topped maybe 150 between their first two records, right? So in four months, it's exploded on the charts. And four days later, Dwayne is killed in a motorcycle accident. Misses every bit of the success. And the band keeps on. That's, to me, that's the most remarkable part of this story. They played at his funeral. I have a picture of it here. I've stolen that. Every time I'm at a funeral for my family, I play. It's the one way I know to sort of get out my grief and honor the people that are gone. And um, I've insisted that Mountain Jam be played at my funeral at the end of it. Because <laughs> that's what heaven sounds like, is what I have told my family. So, um, you know, it, it, it's... It's, it's a tragic story for Dwayne, but the thing that I go with is it didn't end when he died. And that's what I, thank God, I got a chance to be a part of it my many years later and eventually write a book on it. One more. You have one more question right here. Bob, I'd like to pull on your expertise with the first album. The photograph in the middle of the cover was it perhaps taken at Maggie Valley, North Carolina? It was not. So um, the gatefold of the Almond Brothers uh, debut album has five guys waist deep in water in a creek and Butch Truck standing behind one dude is um, he's hiding his um, uh, package behind somebody's head so you can't see him. Butch didn't kneel in the water because he had a, um, stitches in his knee. That's that story. That's actually at Otis Redding's ranch. And um, when you see the pictures of Dwayne naked inside the Boss Skaggs album, that was uh, taken at that same at that same session. But that is not Maggie Valley. That's um, the that's Otis Redding's ranch somewhere outside of Macon. Just trying to confirm or deny naked in a stream, a rumor from North Carolina yeah. back in the day. The, the, you know, the Maggie Valley, probably closest story to that. I, I don't know where love Valley is in relation to Maggie Valley, but they had a huge festival in, in uh, 1970 that um, love Valley was this made up uh, Western town in, in North Carolina. And they played the festival. It's one of the few times we have video of Dwayne Allman uh, with the original Almond Brothers band. It was synced up, silent video that synced up, somebody synced up to a, a recording. Bob, tell our audience where to find your blog online. So uh, any online, at long live the ABB. Instagram, Twitter, Facebook. Uh, my Substack is actually long live the ABB substack.com. That's my blog. That's my long term, my long form stuff. YouTube at long live the ABB. Uh, there's a lot of talks like this. Um, they're all different. Ah, I did it, right? So I do this because this is jazz to me. Conversation is jazz also. Uh, jazz is reacting to the moment. Jazz is reacting to your friends and your colleagues' expertise, uh, looking at the audience and seeing the things that, that hit there. And I like to do this because it demonstrates what the band does too. When, when good people or when people come together uh, in common cause to discuss something that means a lot to them, it just comes better than me standing up there presenting and watching your eyes glaze over. So um, I have a lot of different talks online and, and uh, you know, my goal is to continue having this conversation. It's one of my most fun things I do ever. I'm, I look forward to these, these gigs all the time, meeting y'all, talking with my friends. So at long live the ABB all over the socials. That's pretty much where, where I'm at. Everything but TikTok. <laughs> it's been great to talk to you today, Bob. Appreciate you, buddy, being here. Let's thank Bob Beatty. He'll be available out in the lobby to sign books. Thank you for being here today. All right, I'm going to go race and do that, y'all, for those of you. Two bucks. <laughs> <laughs>